Imagine walking into your home after a long day of work, expecting to spend a nice evening with your children. But instead, you walk in to find that your child has been brutalized and her life taken from her. That is what Johanna's mother had to live through. Even though she had taught her children how to protect themselves and how to stay safe, none of it was enough. None of it could have stopped this monster from doing what he would get into this but before we get into this tragic case, I want to take a moment to thank Ana Luisa for partnering with me on today's video. Ana Luisa is a jewelry brand built to deliver simple, beautiful, high-quality jewelry at a fair price. They really have something for everyone with their long-lasting, tarnish-resistant jewelry essentials that not only make you look good, but you can feel good wearing them. Ana Luisa jewelry is made to stand the test of time with strength and humidity testing with pieces that will not break your budget. I've been loving these little dainty hoops that I've been wearing every day. The hoop I have in my first piercing has this cute little butterfly dangly. Then the second piercing I have is a little double hoop that I am in love with. I love having pieces that I can wear every day to subtly uplift my whole look. Ana Luisa has so many different pieces that can really show your unique personality. Ana Luisa offers free and fast U.S. shipping and exchanges as well as affordable worldwide shipping. So next time you want to grab a piece for your next get together or party or just want to treat yourself, you will be ready. Ana Luisa jewelry is also crafted with the planet in mind. The brand is carbon neutral and climate neutral certified, offsetting 100% of their carbon footprint. So whether you're buying for yourself or as a gift, you can feel good about your purchase. So go ahead and give Ana Luisa's jewelry a tryout for yourself. You can get up to 30% off their already affordable prices when you head to their website using my link down below. Once again, click the link in the description box below and you can get up to 30% off of your order. Thank you again so much to Ana Luisa for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. This is the tragic story of Johanna Ortega. 12-year-old Johanna Ortega was living with her mother, Patricia Velasquez, and her two siblings, a 14-year-old sister and a 10-year-old brother, in a trailer in Hillview Acres in Goodlettsville, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. At the time, Johanna was attending Liberty Collegiate Academy, a charter school in the area. Now, because Patricia was a single mother who also had to work to provide for her children, sometimes her three children would be home alone during the day. But anytime this would happen, she had strict rules in place for the children to follow so that they would be safe when their mother wasn't there to watch. They were not allowed to leave the house and were not to open the door for anybody, regardless if it was a stranger, a friend, or a neighbor, or whoever. If someone knocked, they were to make no sounds such as walking around or talking until the person left. As I stated, they did live in a trailer home, so it seems relatively easy to hear inside and figure out if someone was home, so Patricia wanted to make sure that anybody with bad intentions would not be able to enter the home or take advantage of the children, so that is why she had a little bit stricter of rules in place. By August 10th, 2017, Johanna's two siblings went off to school, but Johanna actually stayed home that day because she had hurt her ankle from a roller skating accident and was giving it some rest to heal. Later in the morning, Patricia made some sushi, Johanna's favorite food, and the two sat together and ate before it was time for Patricia to leave for work. When she left, she told Johanna to stay in her room and to keep quiet the entire day until she returned. The day went on as normal for the hours that followed. However, by 4.15 p.m. that day, Patricia received a text from Johanna saying, mom, somebody's knocking on the door. But then by 4.19, she sent another text saying, I think it was the man who cuts the yard. However, because Patricia was at work and didn't have her phone, she didn't see the text message until two hours later when she got off of work. When she saw the message by 6.07 p.m., she replied, okay, don't make any noises. At the same time, Patricia was driving up to the school to pick up Johanna's brother and sister. They got home by 6.30 p.m., but once Johanna's sister entered the home, she was met with a very disturbing scene. Immediately after entering the bedroom she shared with Johanna, she yelled out, Mom, something's happened to Johanna. Patricia ran in to see what was going on, and there they found Johanna lying on the ground on top of a pile of clothes. 
Her pants and underwear had been pulled down and her yellow karate belt had been looped around her neck two times and tied in the back with a double knot. She also had blood in her mouth and ears. She was unresponsive and it was clear that something horrible had happened. Patricia took the karate belt off of Johanna's neck in an attempt to save her life and tried to wipe some of the blood off of her face with a tissue. Meanwhile, Patricia told her other daughter to call 911 to report what happened. By the time officers arrived, they were met with Patricia, who understandably was frantic and hysterical. Once they entered the scene to examine Johanna, they found that she had no pulse, and it was at that time that they determined that Johanna had been killed. At the time, they removed Patricia and the other kids from the trailer and secured the scene for investigation. When they started looking around, they found that the door to the master bedroom was shut. So, they went inside and noticed a sheet of glass from the window in the sink. They noticed that the curtains in the window had been ripped off and the shelving in front of that window had been knocked over and was lying on the toilet. Upon looking outside of the trailer where the window was located, they saw that there were pry marks on the back of the window as well as indentations on the bottom of the window seal. Based on these findings, detectives felt that this window is probably where someone entered and exited the house when they attacked Johanna. Throughout the house, officers also collected other bits of evidence. They collected an iPad, several karate belts, a cigarette, a pair of latex gloves, and the mattress from Johanna's room. Additionally, they found several spots of what appeared to be blood all throughout the home, including on the toilet paper package in the bathroom, as well as on different surfaces throughout the hallway, a door, and on Johanna's bed frame. After examining the scene and collecting the evidence, 12-year-old Johanna's body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found that Johanna suffered from multiple injuries, including contusions to her head and around her ankle. She had abrasions on her knees and ankles, which were consistent with her legs striking the metal bed rail. She was also found to have petechial hemorrhaging on her eyes, eyelids, cheeks, nose, mouth, and on her back. According to the ME, this happens when, quote, the ligature is so tight it will block the whole blood supply to the brain so there's no blood supply and the pressure builds up. There was another mark on her cheek which could be consistent with her face hitting the corner of her dresser as well as marks on her nose and face that are consistent with being stomped on by a shoe. And of course, there were several injuries and bruises left where the karate belt was found around her neck. The karate belt was used as a ligature to strangle her. Using all of this information, the medical examiner determined that she had been beaten and choked before her death, with her cause of death being strangulation. They did perform a rape kit and swabbed her for DNA, but they noticed no trauma to her genital area, so it does not appear that she was raped or sexually assaulted. Based on what I just told you, it's clear that Johanna suffered a horrific, terrifying death at the hands of someone who broke into her home and attacked her. As this was happening, detectives went around the area of Johanna's home to question any and all neighbors to see if they saw or heard anything that could be helpful. For the first few interviews, it didn't seem like anyone had anything helpful to say. Everyone either had an alibi or they said they didn't hear anything or see anyone break into the home. But as they were going around and questioning people and investigating the scene, there was one neighbor who appeared particularly interested in what was going on. This man was questioned by officers and he said that he was just running errands all throughout the day and hadn't seen or heard anything. But a while after being questioned, he walked up to the scene and approached an officer to see what was going on while smoking a cigarette. The officers on scene thought that it was very strange that this one man was just lingering in the area, so they asked him again if he had anything to share and he basically said no. By the following day, as police were continuing their examination of the scene, once again, they saw this neighbor lingering. He walked past, and this time, he saw a pair of purple latex gloves sticking out of his pocket. That was obviously a bit strange. A few days passed, and by August 17th, officers were preparing to release the crime scene and allow the family to come back home. But as they were doing so, the same neighbor approached the officer once again, apologizing for his behavior on the night of the murder. 
I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to, and neither did this detective. So, the officer told this neighbor that he would actually like to sit down and speak with him about the murder the following day, so he agreed. This neighbor turned out to be 45-year-old Roy Coons Jr., a neighbor who had also worked with the family for a few months to cut their grass and do lawn work. By August 18th, officers arrived to his home to do an official interview. In this interview, Roy told officers that he and his father, Roy Sr., had been living in that area for quite some time. Sr. lived there for 17 years and had been letting his son live with him for many of those years. Roy Sr. had actually been friends with the man who lived in the trailer before Johanna's family moved in in 2015. According to Roy Jr., he and his father would go to the man's trailer to socialize and help out around the place on almost a daily basis. He would change the faucet, replace the carpet, and things like that. Then, when this man passed away, Roy helped move his furniture out of the trailer so that the family could move in. So, both him, Roy Jr., and his father, Roy Sr., had been inside that particular trailer many times while their friend still lived there. After Johanna and her family moved in, though, he had never stepped foot inside the trailer except for the doorway entrance where he had once asked about a lawnmower. In terms of the day of the murder, Roy said that he left his home between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. to get cigarettes and spend some time in his shed. By 3 p.m., he went to check the mail, and it was at that time that he saw kids coming home from school. After checking the mail, he went inside to watch a movie. At the same time, he was also dog-sitting for a friend, so he was with that dog for about an hour before leaving around 4 and taking the dog back home. After returning from the friend's house, that is when he saw police outside of Johanna's house and was curious as to what was going on. He said that he had spoken with Johanna before in the past, but not any time recently, so there was no reason for his DNA to be on her. When asked what he thinks should happen to the person who killed Johanna, Roy said, quote, I would pretty much make sure that they endured whatever my child did, you know? Like I was telling y'all yesterday, Mr. Joe's sister-in-law's husband, the detective, was telling her about the, uh, rape and strangulation and stuff like that. When he's talking about Miss Joe, he's referring to one of his neighbors. But what really stuck out to investigators about this comment was that the way her body was found, i.e. her pants being pulled down and the strangulation, neither of that information had been made public. So, why did he seem to just know what happened? That is guilt knowledge and really made investigators believe that Roy Jr. was their man. But, at the time, there wasn't enough solid information to make an actual arrest. They didn't have any other evidence that pointed towards him being responsible, so they just had to let him go while they continued their investigation. Just for the sake of avoiding confusion for the remainder of the video, when I refer to Roy, I mean Roy Jr., not his father. As police continued talking to different people in the area, they came across a homeless man living in a campsite near the mobile home park where Roy and Johanna lived. This man said that he met Roy briefly in 2016 and the two interacted, but there wasn't much else there. But in September of 2017, a month after Johanna's murder, Roy returned to the homeless camp and asked this man if he could stay with him in his tent. So, the man gave Roy a spare tent and helped him set up a space for him to stay. While living in the campsite, Roy said that he planned to move to California and asked this man to come with him. The man didn't want to, so he just changed the subject of the conversation and tried avoiding talking about it. There were also several times where Roy mentioned to the man things like, if I ever killed someone, do you think God would forgive me? Then, Roy asked the man if he had ever killed someone, and of course, the man said he hadn't. But Roy said that he had killed someone, saying, that shit sticks with you. At the time, he didn't say who it was or when he apparently killed someone. But again, this is obviously a very suspicious thing to say. The next part of the investigation was to forensically examine the crime scene itself to see if they could find any physical evidence that proved Roy's involvement in Johanna's murder. First, they did examine Roy's cell phone and found out that his phone pinged in the area of the mobile home park at the time of the murder. This isn't all that groundbreaking, however, because he did live there. 
I believe the friend whose dog he was watching was also a neighbor of his, so even if he was in the area, that didn't technically prove anything. But they did find DNA in several areas around the trailer that told a very interesting story. They found DNA on that window to the master bedroom. Like I said, it was shown that someone broke in through that window and made entry that way. When comparing that DNA to Roy, it was a match. They also found his DNA on Johanna's face, buttocks, and her arm. They also found his partial DNA profile in other areas of the home, but the most solid DNA was found on those areas of Johanna's body, as well as on the window used to break into the home. At this point, all of these findings pointed directly at Roy Coons for being responsible. His odd behaviors, his guilt knowledge, the fact that he apparently told a friend that he killed someone, then his DNA being found on her body and at the scene. All of that pointed towards Roy being responsible for 12-year-old Johanna's brutal, violent murder. So, by late September of 2017, Roy Coons was arrested and charged with the murder of Johanna Ortega. Of course, Roy pleaded not guilty and awaited his trial in jail. By July of 2019, almost two years after 12-year-old Johanna's murder, the trial for murder started. The prosecution stated that on the late afternoon of August 10th, 2017, Johanna was at home nursing an ankle injury when Roy Coons knocked on the door. He probably knocked thinking Johanna would answer since she technically had known him from prior interactions with him taking care of their lawn. Little did he know, her mom prepared her for this exact moment, so instead of answering, she texted her mom to alert her. This didn't stop him though. When she didn't answer, he went to the side of the home and made entry through the window. Once inside, he attacked her, strangling her with a yellow karate belt, turning a once prized possession, a symbol of her hard work, into the tool used to take her life. He twisted it around her neck so tight that it caused her to choke to death. He then attempted to rape her, as seen by her pants being pulled down, but for whatever reason, it doesn't appear it actually happened because there was no sign of rape in her autopsy. He then fled, leaving her beaten and brutalized body on the bedroom floor for her sister and mom to find just hours later. When they found her body, her mom attempted to untie the two knots left in the belt, but it was too late. The prosecution brought up the text messages, which showed that she identified the man at her door as the man who cut her grass, aka... Roy. His DNA was then found on her body and around the home. He had guilt knowledge in his interview and said some very suspicious things to that homeless friend. On the other hand, the defense argued that this case isn't nearly as solid as the prosecution would want the jury to believe. As I stated before, Roy and his father had been in that trailer numerous times before the murder. His DNA being there doesn't mean that he murdered Johanna. It just means that he was at the trailer at some point. We know that he fixed things around the place, so he could have fixed the window at some point, resulting in his DNA being there. Then, when it comes to the DNA being on her body, she could have shook hands or interacted with Roy on another occasion, leaving his DNA on her body that way. However, the prosecution came back and asked the jury to use their common sense. He asked what the likelihood that Roy's DNA would sit dormant on different areas of the home for two years since he had been in the home. Again, he said that he had never stepped foot into the home after Johanna's family moved there. So, for his DNA to have sat there for two years, that would mean that they never cleaned the area, never cleaned the window. Then, prior to his DNA being found on Johanna's body, he denied having any physical interactions with her that day. Yet, DNA was on her body. He said that it must have been from a handshake at another time, but again, it didn't happen that same day. So, for his DNA to still be on her body from a prior interaction, that means that she didn't shower for multiple days since whenever her last interaction was, and somehow that DNA from a handshake got transferred to other areas of her body. In their closing arguments, the defense pointed out all of the evidence they didn't have to prove Roy's guilt. They didn't have shoe prints, no eyewitnesses, and no fingerprints. 
They said that as a karate student, Johanna would have fought back, leaving signs of a struggle and scratches all over Roy, but there was none of that. Based on the evidence presented at trial, there was not enough to convict Roy of this crime. But the prosecution said that it's possible that Roy wore gloves, leaving behind no fingerprints, and it's possible that he took his shoes off after entering the home, leaving no shoe prints. Then, the biggest factor here is that Johanna was nursing a hurt ankle. She isn't going to be able to do a roundhouse kick or any other type of self-defense when you're standing on a sprained ankle. She couldn't even walk, so it makes sense that she wasn't in any position to defend herself. And, to be honest, I think he probably knew that. In my opinion, that is probably why he chose to attack her when he did. He had probably waited for a long time, but when he saw that she was injured and would be home alone, he took it as an opportunity. After closing arguments, the jury was sent off for deliberations, where they deliberated for four hours before coming back with their verdict. The jury decided that Roy did kill Johanna, but disagreed with the prosecution that it was planned. So, they found 42-year-old Roy Coons Jr. guilty of second-degree murder as well as the attempted rape of a child. As the verdict was being read out, Roy started crying as his first show of emotion throughout the trial. Please be seated. I'll address the fourth person. Mr. Fourth person, have you reached the verdict? All right, would you please stand and reach your verdict? I'll try to get this right. All right. We, the jury, find the defendant Ronald Don Coons Jr. in count one, guilty of second degree murder. Count two, felony murder, guilty. Count four, guilty of attempted rape of a child. And count five, guilty of aggravated criminal trespass and habitation. All right, is that your considered verdict? Yes, Your Honor. All right, please be seated. I'm going to ask each of you the same question, starting with juror number 14. Is that your considered verdict? Yes. For this, Roy was issued a sentence of life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years for the murder. Then he was given an additional 25 years to serve for the attempted rape. So, in total, he will have to spend at least 50 years behind bars before he will be eligible for parole. At his sentencing, he continued to deny involvement, saying that him going to jail is allowing the real perpetrator to walk free. Roy Coons will spend life in prison, but today he was given 25 more years to his sentence. Emotions ran high inside of the courtroom. Tears came from both the victim's mother and Coons himself. He was found guilty for felony murder, second degree murder, attempted rape of a child and especially aggravated burglary. The child's mother was on the stand with a translator. Listen to what happened when she gave her testimony about how this crime has changed her life. And then listen to Coons as he argued that he was not guilty of the crime. Everything has changed. Our lives have changed completely. It has destroyed my family. I don't deserve to go to prison for the rest of my life for a crime I didn't commit. By letting the real perpetrator go and preventing him by not being able to admit to a mistake and bring him to justice is beyond my understanding. Prosecutors argued that his statement was not credible because of his criminal past, which includes lying to police. After his sentence, he did file an appeal, but this was ultimately denied. And as far as I know, he has never shown any remorse for what happened and continues to deny involvement. But in my opinion, as I stated, I think he's guilty. I think Johanna knew exactly who was at her door and that is why she texted it to her mother. I think that right there shows that he was present at the home at the time of the murder. And obviously, even though the DNA was a little bit questionable, I do believe that it was not there from two years prior. 
That just doesn't seem plausible, and the most reasonable explanation is that Roy is responsible. You don't just end up with DNA on your buttocks and face from shaking hands with somebody. I think Roy is a sick monster who is right where he belongs. Again, I think he wanted to target Johanna for a long time, but after she hurt her ankle and ended up being home alone, he used that as an opportunity to strike and finally carry out his dark, disgusting fantasy. I do think it was planned because I don't think you break into someone's house like that without the most dark intent, but I can see how the jury came to that conclusion given that the weapon he used was from inside the house and he didn't bring one himself. But even though he was found guilty of second degree, I'm glad that he has a very long sentence and I'm hoping he never sees the light of day ever again. But that is all of the information we have for today's video and you heard my thoughts. So now I want to know what you all think. Do you think this DNA evidence was enough to convict Roy? Do you agree with the verdict? Or do you think something else happened? If so, why? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, don't forget to head to the link down below and get up to 30% off of your order with Anna Luisa. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!